evening, everyone. What did you guys think of the video I sent you? Did you dig it? A lot of work went into that. Hope you guys dug it. Made some new music, kind of-ish, for it. Let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog, my recap partner. He is the Pascal Ripper. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Excellent video essay. My brother, my comrade, my homie. Uh, this was, I don't want to say fun to do. Um, I don't know if you noticed on Instagram, I tagged Chuck D. <laughs> this seemed, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, maybe you'll check it out. I don't know. You follow um, me on Twitter. Oh, well, you know. Make sure you tweet it out to him. Maybe he'll he'll check it out. I uh, a writ so just so you guys know, there's a video essay that will be a or video. There's an essay that will be accompanying this. A lot of the script that I read off of was part of that essay, but there are definitely large chunks that are not in it because it definitely gets a little more into the weeds on like the crack economy, a little bit more about uh, just the economy at that time. Uh, there's certain things that I put in there because I definitely wanted to paint a picture of a how things haven't changed i mean a big reason why i i start off the clip with that oprah young white lady is because i don't think much discourse has changed when we talk about law enforcement when we talk about poverty when we talk about many of our domestic issues they kind of always boil down to the wickedness of white people and there definitely was a racist element to the Los Angeles police force. But the Los Angeles police force at the time of the Rodney King beating actually was a lot more racially diverse than it was in 65. So trying to always compare 65 and 91, I think, are very unfair comparisons. And, and I, I look at them as almost just illogical. Uh, the police force, by the time we get to 1990, looks more like the community. They're, the L.A., I think, is 11 percent black and the police force is about 13 percent black, about 40 percent of the police force almost about 40 percent in 90 is made up of you know black, Latino, Asian uh, ethnic groups. Um, there was even. A, a Latino man involved in the Rodney King beating and a woman originally, because remember the highway patrol pulls him over. So he had a multi-ethnic, multi-gendered uh, beat down. And a lot of the footage that you see of even riot footage that breaks out, it's a lot of black cops involved, <clears throat> you know, at that time. And a lot of black cops involved and also a lot of the destruction that you see uh, in LAPD as they bring the the hammer down, so to speak. And another another thing that the Rodney King videotape does is it brings to light that there is a problem with law enforcement. And it had been a problem that black community leaders had been tamping down for some time because they felt as if you have a two headed problem. You have violent drug gangs and the rise of the new political economy of crack cocaine, which was extremely violent. And then on the other hand, you have a very violent police force. And there's a lot of things that, you know, there's only so much of the story you can tell in, in a half hour. I try to make these things at max about a half hour. But one thing that I think we never talk about is just economics in general. Uh, and sometimes we say deindustrialization and then just walk away from the term and don't really understand what it does to a municipal tax base. Uh, so putting Milton Friedman in there, especially putting Milton Friedman from the eight, I think it was 1980 that clip was taken, is important because we need to understand that the conversations that we're getting all the publicity were the race conversations. These economic conversations were had on PBS or early in the morning. They're very quiet and distinguished gentlemen having smart people talk that most people ignored. 
you know, what's very important about what you're saying, Jason, is that not only were the economic conversations not being held in the more open, contentious media thoroughfares, but the economics conversations were not really explaining why we had changed the way in which capitalism functioned in American society post-1971 to a new order in which the utility of the state as a means of subsidizing government goods has been had been, had been uh, basically abandoned as a philosophy. You know, that, that conversation about the transition from what has been called the Bretton Woods standard of American mm -hmm. economics, where America basically had a monopoly over international trade from 1944 up until 1971 with the rise of Germany and Japan and the uh, the London gold shock that that re that reorders the whole nature of, of Western capitalism. No one discusses that there was an intentional decision made in the direction American capitalism would go in, and that because of that period of time mm -hmm. being in confluence with the urban rebellions and riots, it made it very easy to disproportionately, not exclusively, but disproportionately make black and brown communities the bloodletting for the losses that needed to be taken for that shift in the economy, while at the same time, eventually that bloodletting spills out with the rise of the new left and Clinton and in the NAFTA and GATT all across the country. It's it's uh when you talk about the drug economy, especially the cocaine economy, um I think it's really important to look at the fact that uh I was on a show recently, I was on David Feldman's show and he kept saying when the CIA brought crack into the black community, when the CIA brought crack into the black community, drugs had already existed there first and foremost. We have to understand that before iran contra <laughs> and it's the free flow of cocaine from a different side opposed to it coming just from you know miami it was already coming in through the east coast since like the late 60s early 70s quite a bit of it um and by the time you get to the 80s and late 70s uh any sort of what were we saying the other day, Pascal? All of the brothers were strung out, assassinated, or in prison. So you have the derivative of all these movements, Panthers. Well, the brothers from the, a lot of the brothers from the movement, but you have a, a new cadre of upper middle class, mobile, Cosby kid loving brothers who are also getting those good, nice six figure government jobs mm -hmm. getting the ivy league education on getting that c-suite office at that wall street uh, law firm as well so remember the dichotomy we, i talk about this on the show a couple of times 1987 87 issue of ebony magazine august issue ebony magazine of course we know the standard of the black middle class coming out of chicago and on the front cover is a black man in a business suit, a black woman in a business suit, the new black middle class. Are you in or are you out? This is Reagan's America, by the way. And that's not the first one they did. The first one they do is in 73. Right. The rising black middle class. Exactly. So there is this dichotomy. And it's really important, right? There is this dichotomy that American policy has in the post-civil rights era. And frankly, it's, it's kind of bipartisan, but Republicans do it as well. Expand the black middle class and crush the black poor and working class as much as possible, and no one will have a problem, you know? And that works okay up until Clinton, 
who was like, yeah, we can expand the black middle class, really crush the black working class and poor, but we're going to really crush the white working class and poor as well and crush everyone. Oh, man, this is, this is a sad message. Uh, the early 90s were pretty rough, e- even for me as a white kid in Florida. Both my parents were crack users. My mom got clean and worked her ass to take care of four kids. Dad finally passed last year. OD'd in a trap house. Got the news of my grandma's on, uh, what you say, January 6th. I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, sorry to hear about that, bro. This horror, look, I... I, I the 90s and 80s were rough. Uh, if you listen to my interview with Doug Lane on Sublation Media, I, I actually cried at a certain point in it because we got to talking about things that I hadn't thought about in decades. And uh, the that era for me was a violent time. It was a time where I had to dodge a, a fair share of bullets. My young brother, who's 30, I'm 40, he's about 35 now. Um, his first memory is me covering him as some kids were shooting at us just to shoot at us. Um, so I remember the rhetoric coming from a lot of the activist circle that was even Panthers. And it was that there is a, a violent uptick of these almost inhuman creatures you know that sociopath rhetoric didn't really stop at law enforcement you have people like uh ishmael reed saying things like these black drug dealers are black fascists and ishmael reed uh actually is a is a long time black i guess you, would you call him a black nationalist pascal i would I, it's hard to categorize but i wouldn't say He's definitely a uh, defender of black masculinity and the black man, <laughs> just to say it that way. I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't feel comfortable necessarily calling him a, a nationalist, but uh, you know, he, he, him using the term uh, black fascist when it comes to crack dealers. You have people like Harry Edwards, who was, uh, he had some position with the Panther Party in the '60s. I know he was a part of that Olympic protest where they have right. the raised fist. But, uh, you know, he says in an interview in I forget which magazine it is. It was it's not it's a, a San Francisco magazine, but I can't remember which one it was. because He's a Bay Area guy. Um, he said in an interview in regards to what would you do if you were a 13 year old child, you found out he was dealing drugs. And mind you, this is before the drug laws. This is before three strikes. This is at a time when young people. My this is my age when I'm 12 years old are dealing drugs because they're not going to get hard time. And he is saying, put them away. Lock them up as long as you can. He's no good. So before Rodney King, again, I, I can't stress it enough, before Rodney King's videotaped assault, even though LAPD is beating the shit out of people on the street, Another thing you don't hear talked about too much with LAPD, and I think it's because it was, again, a multiracial event. They decimated an apartment complex because uh, one of the police captains wanted to crush a gang called the Rolling 30s. And he had had intel that one of the gang members lived in this one apartment complex, but they also knew that some of the, the gang members were using uh, the people's, the older people in this, these apartment complexes kind of as cover for their operation. And, you know, I don't even know if you know about this, Pascal. So the cops had a warrant. It's, it said that they had the wrong house, the wrong apartment, but they, destroyed the building took the stairwell like took fixtures out grabbed all the clothes from the children that lived in it poured bleach all over it found all the food and the cereal for the kids poured it all out poured all the milk out so the kids couldn't eat saying it while they were doing it i mean you you know what's really important about what you're conveying here jason and i don't I don't know if you really appreciate this, is that there is a change in the discourse around poverty and the poor that happens in this period after the civil rights movement 
that of course there's a racial component. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's no doubt about that. It's often easy to to focus on that. But the notion of the undeserving poor, the notion that the poor are socially and culturally at fault, the the uh, you know the underclass ideology, the whole concept of the the underclass being socially dysfunctional at a time where the paradigm of an economy in which the government had been subsidizing ascension into the middle class, mm -hmm. largely disproportionately for white males for a period of almost 40 years. But at the same time, when that whole largest paradigm collapses, now the people who are given no means to enjoy that largesse mm -hmm. and that advancement upward into the middle class have been reduced to subhuman in the consciousness of American society. Mm -hmm. This really starts happening in the 80s. Mm -hmm. and I remember vividly how that kind of imagery, that imagery, it's not only something that you hear in policymakers, you see that in movies like Trading Places. Oh. You see that in film. You see that in popular culture. This notion that the rich are the moral stewards of American society and anyone who ain't them, particularly the Wall Street wealthy, and particularly those who ain't them are degenerates, was very, very ever-present in the 80s. It, it, you know, that whole degenerate... Uh mindset is really interesting that you bring that up because um in doing this i also did a lot of research because in writing the article um when it came back from the editors gene and doug doug was a lot harder than gene as far as like well can, i need i need a few more sources here i need a few more quotes i need a few more facts here so that sent me down a deeper rabbit hole on reagan era california governor reforms and to the welfare state. And when he got into office as governor, he was constantly trying to position himself because Nixon was also governor of California as a stronger and more to the right Nixon. So Reagan at this time in, in the early 70s is even to the right of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman wants to do away with welfare as we know it from a federal level. And he wants to do a basic income. Of, I believe it was $1,600 a month. He was That's like, just correct. give him some money. And you're fucking done with it. Um, and Reagan is like, nope, because that's going to make people lazy. And Reagan fought very hard. He lost a bit. I'll take it back. He didn't lose. The reform wasn't everything that he wanted, but um, the whole point was to start to demonize these people that were receiving any sort of government help. And there was a bit of fraud as you're going to have. People are going to fall through the cracks. It's just a thing. But it was blown way out of proportion. And we're not even getting into the whole welfare queen thing. Ronald Reagan was really good at uh, overstating facts and telling these jokes. But this is the thing, though, right? Mm. This all is existing in a counter-revolutionary period mm -hmm. that's using the punchline of, you see, we went too far with that civil rights stuff. That's why we have all these problems. Yeah. Remember, what's his name? Um, what was the name of the, the U.S. senator from Tennessee? who was friend with Strom Thurmond, who literally got in trouble for saying that, who basically saying, see, if we had listened to, to, to Strom Thurmond when all this civil rights stuff was going on, I'm we wouldn't have had all these problems. Oh, God, who is it? Derek Varn, you know who it is. You're yeah, like the perfect hair. <laughs> Varn, you know exactly who this is. Who is it, Varn? I forgot the name of the guy. I'm sorry. But, um, uh, yeah. It's and I and I had I read a fair share of 
of articles and academic articles actually about that era, the Reagan era and, and welfare reform. Um, it didn't happen as hardcore as, as you would think, but it definitely happened, but it set up the groundwork for the, the idea of work fair, a right. work means testing. And what did happen during his time in office was that it was like, you have to take a job if you're offered a job. So what was happening was also when Reagan gets into, oh, I think it is Trent Lott. No, that's Mississippi. It's Trent Lott. I think you're right. I think I got the state wrong. I think it is Trent Lott. It is Trent Lott. Wrong. Um, uh, what you get, and I, I think I say it in the video essay, is uh, the Bracero program ends in 65. So now you have an influx of undocumented labor and a lot of it's kind of stuck there so you are seeing some outgrowth in the outer cities in in los angeles of of the aerospace industry definitely the film industry um and definitely into the 90s with the real estate industry none of that stuff is based in la proper it's not based in downtown this is like orange county almost you know just the the, the outer cities maybe pascal would call them the outer boroughs if you you know if you it helps you see it better. Um, and there's no tax base in South Central at this point. It was already hurting in 65. By the time we roll around to the 90s, it's really hurting. It's literally one of the poorest predominantly black cities, if not the poorest black city in America. And the businesses that if you see them, the ones that burned down, it wasn't like right and black owned saved you. You know, I, I put that in the video essay. It was a lot of small mom and pop cheap. The swap meets were massive, massive swap meets uh, in, in L.A. back then. These big buildings. And, you know, you had swap meets in New York, right? Oh, yeah, man, that was a joint back in the day, man. So when you think about the businesses that were down there, you think about what was going on. I mean, it's, it, it, it looked like a poor city, not as burnout and desolate as like a Detroit looks or the Rust Belt in certain parts of Ohio, but it, very similar. And a lot of people don't realize this. L.A. at one point in time was the number two car manufacturing city in the country behind uh, Detroit. And you know what's so what's so deep about this is that this is going on where in a, in an America where the financialization of everything mm. everything is being rendered to a security securitization a stock a bond this or that to be traded to be rendered the opening up of lines of credits new credit lines new banking fi- the, the way in which high finance is argued to be some kind of sophisticated way to interface with every aspect of life, which is all, by the way, a con, as uh, Varn would call, creating a rentier state of people who just basically don't produce anything but suck blood from blood to Mm. transfer into other blood as a way of making money from each other, becomes the normal way in which this, 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 this economy functions. And we, we see it also with the rise of Oh my God, popular culture, Wall Street news coverage, the CNBC, the Fox business, all of this stuff that starts to transpire in the 90s where regular people all of a sudden are are enthralled by watching digital sequences on their screen that they pretend (laughs) that they understand. Talking about, oh, today we've got a new high. Wells Fargo is doing wonderful. Oh my God. And this this whole shtick that's used to actually pretend that we're doing anything productive Mm -hmm. sucks up like 20 to 25 years of American consciousness and gets people totally sucked into things like hustle culture, black capitalism, uh, 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 conspicuous consumption, Can you you explain for the people conspicuous consumption? 
Say it again. Can you explain for the people conspicuous consumption? Conspicuous consumption is when you basically you go out and buy for the sake of being seen that you're buying. It's like, oh, I want to buy like you know the flyest suit so people know that I can that I have like the really really fly ass you know whatever kind of suit Brooks Brothers or I'm buying like the top the top of the line shoes or whatever house or car or whatever item is. It's something that's so divorced from my consciousness. I mean, conspicuous consumption is basically the notion that you buy items in a capitalist system to to demarcate what your status is so people know what your value is by the actual purported importance and expensive nature of the actual item. So your, your, your value as a citizen is actually connected to the value of the merchandise you purchase. And just to let people know real quick, uh, when, every Wednesday we do a show, it'll always be a different show. And the is this the second Wednesday of the month? The second Wednesday of the month, uh, we do a video essay. And by we right now, it's been me. Do a video essay. And then we do a recap show about that video essay. And uh, I, I really like doing the recap shows with uh, with Pascal. Sometimes we have a guest panel, but. I'm feeling real comfortable uh, with my, my co-host brought back into it. But and this is something that me and Pascal talk about all the time um, from our personal vantage points, because we grew up on opposite sides and, and a bit in different times, but similar times of the country. And for where I was growing, I mean, also when I'm experiencing the the brunt of gang violence, Pascal is gone and he's going to college and law school <laughs> so his life is a little different uh a little bit uh taken away and i don't know how much that affected your neighborhood pascal where you grew up oh you know my brother really saw a lot more of it he's my brother's older than you are as well but it really it's really fascinating that you asked that question right because i watched how the introduction mm-hmm. of hip-hop into music video mm-hmm. normalized a certain kind of uh street chic amongst normally would have been suburban middle class black kids mm-hmm. that help facilitate not to become the corny like it's all hip hop's fault I don't, we don't want to be that guy but there is something to be said about how the urban cool chic of a certain type of gangster hip hop that becomes popular in the 90s does open up a certain aesthetic that normally wouldn't be there. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. When I was growing up in New York City in the mm-hmm. 80s, there were no Bloods and Crips in New York. That was alien to our kind. The, the idea when I was growing up of seeing Bloods and Crips in New York was, was absurd. It was like, th- all of that gang shit looked like some kind of weird LA West Coast nonsense. My dude, like as of the 90s, there's Bloods and Crips all over New York, all up and down the East Coast. Do you think that happens without the proliferation of popularity of West Coast gang culture and hip-hop culture? Oh, dude. Video? Oh, hip-hop is a game changer in a way that I don't think – I think now we can look back on and look at its influence to a degree. Um. But people were so busy. There's an interesting fight that happens. And I think a big problem with this era, and I was thinking about this as I was rewatching it with everybody else. There was so much of a defense of the idea that the lack of funding for government programs was a problem. That it almost felt like black people didn't want to talk about it. Like nobody wanted to say, well, we're not getting the same welfare we were getting before. We're not getting the same food. Now you're making cats go out and work a job. I mean, think about this for a second. You got to go work a job that may be less than what your benefit is. How is that good? Mm. And of course, wages are being brought down once again because you have. A, a, a huge reserve army of labor and part of that reserve army of labor and a major part of that reserve army of labor is undocumented. And mm. another part of it all has felonies. 
So you're just you're constantly driving wages down. You know what there was in Los Angeles in the 80s that no one talks about? And I and I forgot to send you this this uh, document, Pascal. It was kind of long. It's like 40 pages. But uh, a healthcare crisis. Hmm. That's true. Because so many people had worked in industries where you were going to get health care covered. So like you talk about, if you didn't work for the government, i.e. in the school system, and L.A. school district is one of the largest in the nation, if not the largest. If you didn't work for the government, and you didn't have a good job at one of these private companies that was issuing it, you didn't have health care. So now you have millions of people in the city that work, I'm going to have to work, don't have health care coverage. So there was a health care crisis in Los Angeles that no one talks about. Mm-hmm. Well, don't forget that confluence of health care crises is what legitimates the rise of Hillary Clinton being made health care czar in Bill mm-hmm. Clinton's first term, mm-hmm. trying to remedy the situation and basically re- reducing the American health care system to an HMO nightmare to that becomes even more justification for various types of later types of remedies for the system that becomes progressively worse and worse in time in its privatized fashion. But I don't want to make it seem like I'm saying, oh, hip hop is what caused the gangs. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. What I'm saying is that I do think that there is a certain kind of aesthetic introduction of certain normative behavior that affects communities that are not seeing behavior normalized in this music video that perhaps does have an effect but the underlying cause of this behavior is definitely a lack of economic options for these kids and also a proliferation of a type of underground economy drug economy but i would also say that the incarceration mechanisms that, as, as M. Toussaint said, causes a shifting around of individuals from different spaces and different locales is introducing different cultural phenomenon to kids, to places that they normally wouldn't see, that also are going to be replicated in the music as well. So it's a very, very toxic confluence of events that leads to this proliferation of this very violent gang culture. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very sad that people just reduce it to, to like, it was the government that was selling the crack cocaine in the hood because it's a lot more complicated than that without any doubt. Mm-hmm. But the large matter of fact is, is that government is never going to deny any type of means that allows the ability to render more people to the reserve army of labor when in times of neoliberalism, austerity is the only option. Yes. Yes. And, and that's why you put I put the Milton Friedman clip in there. Yeah. I mean, it works well for them. It works well for them. And understand something. We realize how bad this is because of the 2008 crash, mm-hmm. which obviously was going to happen at some point, because thanks to people like Marx, we realize that capitalism does this kind of stuff because it's an unstable system. And it just happened to be that 2008 was a great and serious crash. But the reality is, man, think about how many lives were sacrificed and destroyed to keep this charade of an economic system floating for all these years. And people will say, well, look at all the technological advances we got out of it. Okay, we got <laughs> what, the internet, computers, and cell phones. Wi-Fi, so, all this is oh, state wow, yeah, Wonderful, great. None of that has had a major change in the quality of life of millions and millions of people that are still actually just being ground to dust in this paradigm. And it's still yet some kind of difficult process to get people to understand that capitalism is the freaking problem. Well, if you think about hip hop and you think about gang culture, they're they're very much married to the idea of capitalism. And another thing, originally what the video essay was going to be originally was going to be about the second era of black exploitation, which I feel is really rooted in Moynihan thought of underclass ideology and the defective Negro. And all these big movies that we all look back on and kind of love 
like Boys in the Hood and then the derivative of Boys in the Hood, which is almost a scene for scene remake, Menace to Society, is just Moynihan porn almost. Father, black children that just can't get right, that live in a violent dystopia. And, you know, the thing is, though, is that that type of rhetoric is very, very resplendent in black spaces. The whole kind of like it was the government with the welfare that destroyed a black family, and we talked about this before. How's it? Yeah, have anyone read? Have anyone read E. Franklin Frazier's studies on the black family from like the 1930s? He has a whole chapter on the black matriarchy in the second, like the second chapter of the book is about how single family births, single family parented births of black women was prol- was a proliferated reality in black families going back to the late 19th century. And this notion that somehow it was the welfare that came about in with the great society that caused this phenomenon is not the case, when in reality, it's the fact that the second great migration that goes into the 60s and the late 60s, where Black men are still moving up to the north and are being moving into de-industrialized zones mm-hmm. where there's no work and now are being faced with nothing but crime as an option with the presence of heroin, are now more fastly and quickly becoming destabilized as a means of becoming breadwinners for families, and the family structure is deteriorating as the political economy in those communities are deteriorating. And it's not as something as, something as simple as, like, oh, it was the government welfare that stopped the women from wanting to have the black man in the household. I mean, it's just absurd nonsense that you hear in all these spaces that these, these black nationalists and a variety of people talk about for black conservatives as well. And it's 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 so sad that we have had such a lack of a black left that besides maybe Adolf and a few other brothers on the nationalist tip, nationalist level, who, who black nationalist level, who have been trying to challenge these narratives, that have been willing to stand for black poor and working class people to defend these ridiculous tropes. That unfortunately most of the black liberal elite that we've had that have been you know working trying to get that fat back in biscuits. To maintain their patronage, have been touting these same types of talking points to maintain their ridiculous racial uplift strategies for trying to improve the condition of black people in the first place. And uh, I was watching. There's a there's a really interesting documentary, and I I rather enjoyed it. I don't know if you've ever seen it, and I don't know if people here have watched it. It's called King in the Wilderness. It's about the last years. It. It, it was a book too, and it was the last years of King's life. Where he moved, it talks about his move to Chicago, why he felt. I that. have that book. I bought that book. I haven't read it yet. It's it's a pretty interesting tale, because to your point about fatbacks and fatback and biscuits, there was a patronage politics in New York or no, I'm sorry, in Chicago called the Daily System. Oh yeah. And, and, and oh, Mark yeah. Oh, yeah. King and his crew moved to uh, some some effed up apartments in Chicago to live in with the people and people were kind of shocked that he really was. They said people knocked on the door every day. Like you, you really Martin Luther King? Like you really living in these messed up, uh, these messed up projects. And his whole thing was to, to grow the movement. And that was his big thing. And they were talking about, you cannot grow a movement of people if you are not of the people. So that's where you see the pictures of King in the pool hall, you know. Um, and so one of the things he's trying to do is, you know, get a housing bill passed. And I think they had just maybe gotten the civil rights bill bill passed at this time. But they're facing this racist opposition that they had never faced before in a, you know, quote unquote, multi-ethnic uh, Chicago. There's definitely white ethnics Um and, and Chicago is extremely segregated by these ethnic groups. And this is also the time when King is opposing the war. And Martin Luther King at this point in his life has a direct line in to LBJ. That's a fact. And it's Mayor Daly that's extremely upset because the the King coterie is effing with his patronage system, which was, all right, preacher Joe, how many votes can you get me? Yo, up until he died, Bruce Dixon, who was from Chicago, mm-hmm. got his made his political bones in Chicago, 
was a member of the Chicago Black Panther Party when Fred Hampton is in our lives. He said, pretty much up until the time I left Chicago, which was in the early aughts, there are two types of Black people in Chicago. There are daily Black people and non-daily Black people. <laughs> and what you, what kind of black person you are politically in Chicago is rooted in what is your politics root relative to the daily machine? Yeah, they were, they were, yeah, they talk about it, not a little in depth, but they definitely talk about it on that, on that thing. And they also talk about, uh, King's relationship with Stokely Carmichael and they didn't make it as adversarial as I think a lot of people want to make it as far as Stokely Carmichael, you know, really starting to lean on the idea of uh, black, black power, power. economy and because King actually had a really good uh, idea of power, but he felt that, you know, trying to racialize the idea of power is kind of a dead scene and a waste of time. And you will um, alienate some of your biggest allies. Um I, you know, sometimes I wish he was alive. I'd love to hear his musings on the idea of Black Lives Matter um, as a hashtag or even as a movement. And I say that uh, not necessarily tongue in cheekly, but you know, somewhat facetiously. Actually, um, Black Lives Matter is a movement. I, I don't see that as even an effective uh, strategy because, again, it seems to be based in racial grievance. And I think oh, I see that. Man. I okay. think. It's stuck romanticizing something that existed because of its utility to the ruling class. Mm -hmm. Not to diminish, no, we shouldn't diminish the civil rights movement. Yes, there are many loyal, dedicated people who dedicated their lives to that long civil rights movement that goes from 54 to 64 and onwards, or some would say from the 30s up until the 60s and the late 60s onward. But let's not forget that that was a politics that was working at the behest of the ruling class that was interested in changing its perception because of the way in which it was being challenged by Soviet communism in the global order. And that had a lot to do with why that politics was made to be the normative accepted standard of the day and why it's so romanticized as a means of, of reifying, reifying American capitalism as humane. As much as it's distasteful to say this, one of the distasteful realities of how the civil rights movement is, proper, is propagated is as a humanizer of American capitalism in the consciousness of the world for having this noble movement that made America more free and open that to the point where now re Republicans brag about it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of twisted. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because I feel like we're at a moment where the, the frustrations are never captured. And a big reason why 92 stuck out to me, and it's... It, a, the anniversary hit, and I was kind of shocked that the NFL did a retrospective of the 92 riots. That was shocking to me, but also I'm still – for the draft! Not only did they do a thing about uh, Ukraine, but they also did a thing about the, the riots, like looking back. Um, I, I think we can't look at these as strictly like racial grievance moments. And if you look at the riots of 92 and then look at the the riots of 2020, um, first of all, the riots of 92 were called the Rodney King riots until he spoke. Mm. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hold on my point for a second. When Rodney King is in segue here for a little bit, when Rodney King speaks for a lot of people. It is a letdown because he was so quiet during the trial. He didn't testify. The only time you saw Rodney King speak, he had gotten in trouble with a DUI. And you heard him speak after the beating 
in the in the hospital where he's got all the bandages and stuff on, but he didn't talk. He didn't give he didn't give interviews. When he speaks, what and it gives me I I was in tears making this thing, and I've I've put another of that same clip on every time I watch it. Waterworks. Um, that's the realest words you can hear. His lawyer gave him a couple phrases to say, and you hear him say, no, we're going to have our day in court. Battle's not over. But he's in awe of what's going on in his name. And he doesn't want it. There's dead bodies that he's seeing in his name. He's not a public speaker. He's not an activist. He was never a martyr. Right. He was just a dude. And when he speaks, Pascal, I know you remember this. He was the butt of every joke. Remember Def Comedy Jam yeah. and Comic View? Yeah. Every every comedian made fun of him. Everybody. It, it almost felt like when Eddie Murphy used to talk about Michael Jackson before Michael Jackson was giving interviews. Right. And then Michael Jackson becomes a different butt of jokes after he starts talking and, he, and people start realizing how weird he is. George Floyd never spoke. No one knows anything about George Floyd. He's a he's your martyr. Mm. Burn a city down. Burn many city down. What happened? Who captured anything from this moment all these angry people who captured that energy was it the left was it the right or did people let out all their frustrations and then we got back to business as usual and then a bunch of people you know write books about how uh, there's an elite capture of the idea of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion and anti-racism. We're having the same conversations, but never necessarily talking about the economy unless we're talking about the economy from the standpoint of there's a racial wealth gap. The question starts to become, I mean, are we ever going to be really serious about organizing working class people where they are to challenge this system? Are we so divorced from even understanding what that even looks like that for us to talk about it anymore is really just a kind of self-congratulatory or kind of self-masturbatory is a better way, kind of just game? And we'll just be like, yeah, well, we got to organize. Okay, like, come on, really? How long, How many times are we going to say it? My pessimistic side says that there's too many people trying to capture certain markets and the idea of organizing is, and this isn't everywhere. This isn't everywhere. Sometimes is more of a branding exercise, like professional protesters. Mm. That being said, the hope comes from Starbucks. Chris Smalls, um, more and more people are feeling comfortable with the fact that there is strength in unions. There's power in their labor. Um, the teachers strike in West Virginia gave me the most hope. And I'll tell you why. That is a heterogeneous, in the sense of political thought, group of people from across the state. And I've been in every part of West Virginia, as uh, as uh, what's his name said in Boomerang, from the Ruta to the Tuta. I've been all through that place, in places I had no business being. And I can tell you, <laughs> that's also one of the few places where people have told me because of the color of my skin, they don't want me here. Mm. That being said, these people all got together in the state. To, to strike Los Angeles, the biggest, I believe it's the biggest school district in the nation 
got together to strike. And it wasn't just for smaller class size and better benefits. It was for livable wages in a city you can't afford. It was for true support for the children that needed true support. See, the same thing happened in Oakland. That gets me hopeful because I think there's real organizing going on at a level where people are like, I'm in the factory. I'm on the ground floor. It's not coming in from outside. It's really people that understand. And again, why West Virginia is so big, because it's not a coastal city. It's not New York. It's not L.A. You know, that's truly a almost forgotten part of the nation. So I think there's hope. Um, I make these videos to remind us of the pitfalls, what to avoid. You know, because I always make them with fear, you know, also in the back of my mind of knowing with the with the benefit of hindsight, these are some of the, the rabbit holes we've gone down. And as Pascal constantly tells me all the time, political education is paramount and we need to constantly have it. Um, so I try to make it easily digestible. Um, Next time, I promise I'll I'll leave all my resource material up on the on the end credits and uh, and in the uh, in the uh, show description, so you guys can read a lot of this stuff for yourself. Um, I will say that I did re go back and re read a few chapters of City of Quartz by Mike Davis, which is a very very long book. I even went back and reread uh, Kamala Harris's father, Donald Harris's. Uh, brilliant uh, explanation of the ghetto as an internal colony because i think that's also an important thing to to revisit because i think a lot of the conversation that you see around inner cities always kind of goes back to the ghetto as internal colony which which is definitely uh, not the right not the right rhetoric any closing remarks I want to say that, man, you really outdid yourself. And this is the third one in a row when you really put your foot in it when it comes to these video essays. Uh, and you're really making me feel like I got to get in touch with my inner uh, Haitian child of the Duvalier era and do one on uh, Francois Duvalier and the Duvalier regime. I we talked about this for yeah. over a month. Yeah, I got a couple of good books here on uh, Duvalier that just really, really... Uh, got together uh, that uh, making me think about doing something about Papa Doc. I got a couple of articles about Haiti that I actually got to bang out. But um, but at the same time, you did a good job, man. And I really enjoy being here and being the person that you pick to talk about these essays when you do them. Because I think that the conversations we have are really edifying. They're edifying to me. So I, I, I can imagine the edifying to those who are our viewers as well. Well, I can't, I can't stress this enough. Uh, this has been beyond a learning experience. Is it? It is a learning experience constantly doing this show with you. Um, so it is a benefit and a blessing, and I look forward to many, many more. Indeed, brother. Indeed. And on that note, thank you guys oh so much for hanging out with us. Before I go, let me know what you guys think about the video essay and not just the production of it. Let me know what you think about the content. Do you disagree? I mean, I was on Doug Lane's show and someone disagreed about something extremely pedantic that I said about harm reduction. But, uh, you know, seriously, how do you feel we're going to organize the working class? Where were you in 92 when this happened? Where were you in 92? Uh uh, where were you when the Rodney King beating happened? Um, how did you feel when you saw it on TV? How did you guys feel if you're old enough to remember when you saw a movie like Colors that portrays an outgunned, outmanned police force against the, the gang problem? Um, 
Derek Varn says, most of us weren't born yet. Varn, I will walk to Utah to kick you in the testicles. You know you was watching these movies. <laughs> yeah, this is where it gets depressing when people talk about how old they were in 1993. <laughs> like, you know. Well, and then also juxtapose it to what she remembers seeing in, in 2020. You know? To, for everyone that's making a, a joke about, you know, our age is... You make all the jokes about me. I don't give a damn. But where were you in 2020 and juxtapose what you saw in the footage I sent you and what you saw or didn't see how you felt in that and how or how you felt in 2020? Uh, write a comment. Let me know. Uh, we read them more often than you think. By we, I mean me. I read them when he says them to me. <laughs> when some of them are really good <laughs> there's some really good ones <laughs> that i send to everybody i'm like oh god this this guy really doesn't like us um but thank you guys so much uh we appreciate the hell out of you um the show is growing leaps and bounds we're getting closer and closer to 10,000 subscribers i'm, I'm actually kind of shocked um the thousand patron mark is getting closer and closer to hit where Pascal and I have to do a live show together somewhere in California. That means I got to fly Robert out to the West Coast. Will we do it in San Diego? So I only have a 50 minute drive depending on border traffic. Will we do it in the Bay Area. I'm not telling you guys. But definitely, Pascal and I are going to be with Doug Lane, Jean Bajlan, Cuba, Deep State Cuba. Who else is going to be there? Ashley Frowley is going to be there. Stefan Thor Guevara is going to be there. June 26th in Brooklyn. That's right. So get excited. And on that note, everybody, peace. I'm going. Hopefully it's early enough, Pascal. I'm going to try to get lobster. Oh, there we go. This is the benefit of living where I live. Peace, y'all. Later.